before I start with the actual presentation, I'm going to tell you a little story about how I got to the side of the theme of my presentation. So to start, when we first entered the club, um, the concept of TED Talks was presented to us. And they told us that we needed to find something that was very interesting and very personal to us. And that was something that was so interesting that it was worth being shared with others. So I was flabbergasted by the idea. I thought that I should find like the most interesting topic ever so that everyone would like to hear my talk. And well, I went home and I started to think about it and think about it. And I thought a little bit more and nothing came to mind. And I continued and I thought some more and just I had completely no ideas or too many not so good ideas. So what I decided to do is to throw a coin and go through all my checklist until I got to think that with anxiety. So what I'm going to do today is a quick guide to anxiety. <laughs> it's, it's a joke, I'm just kidding. But one thing about this little story that's just a joke is true. I'm really going to talk about anxiety. But why exactly am I talking about this? So first, I really do think that anxiety is a very important and interesting topic that does not get the attention it deserves recently. And the second thing is that, well, as much as it hurts me to tell you, I do suffer from it, like, quite a lot. And it doesn't make me a healthy person, and I haven't solved it, really. So I think that it would be helpful to other persons to know how to deal with it. So I am going to do a quick guide to anxiety, but with a little twist that it's made by an anxious person. <laughs> um, so to explain to you why I think that it's so important that an anxious person makes a guide to anxiety, I'm going to do a little metaphor to you. So imagine that the problem that we face is a hill. And you're someone down here on the bottom. And you receive advice from someone that's up here, or on the top already. So that's someone that has already solved the problem, that doesn't suffer from it anymore. And um, even though the, the advice that they give you is valid, um, it's difficult for you to relate with the person. Because even though they felt the way in which you, you feel as of now, they don't feel it anymore. They aren't going to your pain. And it's difficult to relate with them. And when you're talking about something so personal and so unconscious, like anxiety, it's very important that both people, the one that's helping and the one that's being helped, have empathy. Let's focus now, <laughs> because I, I talked a lot and didn't go anywhere. So let's start with the types of anxiety, because I can give you the tips if I don't explain to you what is anxiety. So when I started researching about it, um, I discovered that there are lots of types of anxiety and that we have like too much anxiety in our world. And I was just, um, without knowing what I should do, because there's just so much and I didn't know anything about it. But Thankfully, I found this organization that's called anxiety.org and there is an organization that focuses especially on anxiety and categorizes all their types and most of their causes. And I read a little bit about it and even though there are many types of it, all of them have a thing in common. That is, a paralysis that you feel whenever you're anxious. And it doesn't mean paralysis in the way in which you can't move, not necessarily, but those situations in which you can't think straight in which you don't know what to do, and you think about a lot of things and end up doing nothing. So that's the paralysis that I talk about all of you. And it might be caused by very different things, like social situations, fear of being humiliated, situations in which you know you can't go back if you fail, and even if you consume some medicines, they might cause you to get anxious. But one special thing about this paralysis is that it happens to everyone. Everyone has this, but on different levels. Someone that you wouldn't be considered to be an anxious person suffers from it also. But they control it so it's a lot more reduced, the impact of it. So, a very interesting thing about this guy is that it isn't always to those persons that you consider considered anxious. Even you that you think that aren't a very anxious person might profit from it. Because you might control your already little panic attacks and you might even help someone that's close to you, a friend or a relative that suffers from it. So this guy is to everyone, not just to anxious persons. And let's go into the five tips that I'm going to give you in order to deal with anxiety. The first four of them are changes in mindset. So things that you can think of or that you can realize that help you deal with it 
And the last one is a special tip that I made myself that is what differentiates this <coughs> tutorial or guide from others. The first tip is personal confidence. And if I were to resume this tip in just one sentence, it would be, yes, you can. You can do it, because most people think that they aren't capable of doing someone, even though they haven't tried it a lot. And you think so much about it that you end up not being capable of doing it. So people give up before they even try. And that's not happening. That's not what happens always. So this tip is about you getting inspired by others, so that you can gain confidence yourself in order to do all the things that you aspire or that you want to do. And I have two ways in which you can improve your self-confidence. And the first one of them that I found is a life model. And inspiration follows aspiration. So as long as you're inspired by someone or by something, you'll desire to be a better person, a better friend, or a better athlete, or a better student, or everything that you want to be. And you'll achieve great things if you really give yourself into it. So the first one, as I talked about, is a life model. There is a sentence that defines how you want to live. And the sentence rules generally how you deal with situations. The second thing is a role model, someone that you look up to, that you want to be alike or that you want to impress. And it doesn't need to be very, someone that's very famous, like an actor or an athlete, it might be just someone that's very close to you. Like is my personal example. That is my grandma, as you might know. And she's a very important and very special person to me. And she's a role model to me, like I like her a lot. And my life motto is to be someone that can impress her or make her proud. Here am I, besides her, without my glasses. <laughs> so the second tip is to analyze things objectively. Because I know it might have happened to you sometimes, just a little bit of the times, time a little bit of the times, <laughs> is that whenever you fear and you have a problem, it seems like so gigantic. And whenever you just stop to analyze it rationally and <laughs> think about it, <laughs> you see that something that looked a little bit like this is this. Because you overthought it so much. And, well, it's very difficult for you to realize that because you're in so much pressure and so anxious that you can't realize how small the problem really is. A personal example of this that happened to me is that when I was a child, I just sucked at climbing walls. I don't know those places in which you go to climb walls. And when I was a child, I went to a birthday of a friend of mine and we went to a wall that looked a little bit like this, but I just failed miserably the first time that I went. So it looked like this, <laughs> like those giant climbing walls. And as some of you might be aware, in the middle of the year, we went to a place in which we were <laughs> forced to climb walls. We weren't forced, <laughs> but as all my friends were there, I decided, oh, let's give it a try. And by doing it again, without being so much pressure because I was with everyone, I noticed that it wasn't a little bit like this, but more like this, how it really was. And now I quite enjoy myself. I'm not the best climber ever, but I can enjoy myself quite while doing it. The third tip is eliminate aversion to failure. And that's a very interesting one, because like, most people are terrified because they think they cannot fail. Because they think if whenever you fail miserably, like, all persons are going to judge you and say that you're worse and that you can't do anything. But that's not true. Like, all of us make mistakes. And whenever we really realize that, we'll improve as persons. Because if you get something wrong, you learn how to improve it, or at least you should learn how to improve it the next time. And if you get something right and you just redo it, it's right, you don't grow as a person. So, there's a very interesting quote provided by a teacher of ours that's called, experience is the name we give to our mistakes, our failures. Because in order to get experience, to be a better person, we need to fail. Because then we learn with it. So, but that doesn't give you an excuse to go just making all kinds of failures and think that you'll improve as a person just like that. It doesn't happen like this. You need to learn from your mistakes. You need to see why you fail. You need to analyze it objectively, not subjectively with your emotions. And a very interesting, con a very interesting concept that I found is that some slash most things are out of our control in this life. So let me do another metaphor that is, imagine you're on the sea and you're rowing a little boat. And imagine that the sea is all the things that happen in your life that affect you in some way. And the only thing you can do to alter that is row your boat in the direction in which you want to go. You won't control the whole sea just by rowing, but you make a difference with what you can do. So the things that matter 
are not all the things that you can control, but the way in which you do the things that you can, or the way in which you react to the things that you can control. Another example of that is, I suck at football, and I suck at football as of now, because um, I don't have the na nature-born talent to play football, and that's something I can control, but when I was a child I was simply so frustrated because I couldn't do it with as, as little effort as my friends could do it. But I was frustrated with something that I couldn't change. So recently I've been trying to improve and do the things that I can do myself, like train at home, um, put a little more effort in the trainings that we have. So I'm kind of improving. I'm not just the best player in the world, but I do not suck as much as I said before. And the fourth thing, it's not always about the results, but you need to think about the whole process when considering something. And I don't know if it happened to you sometimes, in which you were so obsessed by something that you wanted to get, like, so obsessed that whenever you got, whenever you got the thing that you wanted, it, did, it didn't seem as good as it, you thought it would be whenever you wanted. And regarding that, there's a very interesting quote. I don't remember who said it, but it was a Buddhist person. That is, happiness is not, no, there's no way to happiness. Happiness is the way. Because if you get just short-term things that you want to complete in order to be happy, you'll never be truly happy or truly satisfied or truly confident of yourself. Because you, you think that you need to do other things in order to improve. You don't appreciate life as a whole. And I know it's impossible for you to appreciate life as a whole and be completely happy with everything you have. But at least try it. Because it's a very interesting thing. Another personal example <laughs> is running. As of now, you might have noticed that when I was younger, I just wasn't someone good with sports and something that I was athletic in general, but um, I couldn't run um, as my other friends because I just thought that whenever we were going to run, I just needed to go there and be the first without doing anything. I just wanted to be the first because at that time I wanted to be better than my friends. And as of now, like as six months before this, I started running, but I started to enjoy running at home, just alone without anyone to praise me if I got first. I decided to enjoy running because I enjoyed running. And I've improved as a runner so much because before I started, I could run like only two kilometers, and now if I just give my all, I might run about 10 or 11 kilometers, so that's a hell of an improvement in six months. So try to enjoy doing the things because you do them, not because you'll get a reward after them. And the first and the last special tip is change your environment. I don't know if all of you remember, but we had a philosophy class like a month ago that was regarding cognitive biases. And a very interesting thing that they told us is that even though you're aware of the mistakes and how you make them, that doesn't completely erase the chance of you doing them. And just because you're aware of something and the causes of it doesn't mean that you won't fail it and do it, do it again. So the way in which I found to change your environment is by external influences. And there are two types of external influences that I want to share with you. So the first one is whenever you feel under pressure, you won't remember the four previous tips that I gave you. Because you'll just forget that. Because that, that's how anxiety works. You don't remember things. You can't think straight. But whenever you're in those kinds of situations, Try to notice there are people around you, helps, friends that can help you whenever you're in need, and people that also suffer from it. And a personal example of that is, I think all of you might know a friend of mine, I won't say his name, but you might know he's a very dear friend of me, because he always cry, calls me a crybaby. Whenever I'm just sulking about a problem, he just comes to me and gives me a big slap on the back, and <laughs> stop crying, the problem is not as big as you think. And even though that doesn't solve the problem, that helps me realize that my problems are not as big as I make them appear. And I see that there's a friend beside me that can help me whenever I feel some problems, so that's a very interesting and good thing that I found. The second super top secret thing is physical reminders that you can have. Because as you might notice, like, I have a lot of things, like wristbands, rings, and a necklace. I don't know if this counts as a necklace, but I think it is. And this helps you because, for example, when you do a promise to someone or you want to follow something, just think of this physical reminder as the promise that you made to someone. All of those are promises that I made to persons that are dear to myself or that I didn't directly speak to them, but are motivators. So whenever I feel fear and all of that, I just look at it and remember the promise 
and feel so much confident in order to deal with the problem. So that's something that helps me a lot. And that was the end of my tutorial. And whenever you feel pressured, or whenever you feel anxious again, or if you don't notice, I hope this tutorial helps you deal with it a little bit. Thank you very much.